Hello and welcome to Hammer and Dice. Today we'll be looking at Black Dragon, Volume 1, Number 1. Writing, editing and design by Bill Edmonds with additional artwork by Michael Tenebrae. This issue of Black Dragon contains a generator for inns and taverns, details on the Rune Mage NPC, a small miniatures review and the new class of the Marksman. Just a quick note on the cover here. I think it's a very good homage to the Larry Elmore piece, Dragon Slayers. I'm proud of it with the dead dragon hung from the tree and the adventures gathering around it. But I think this take with the adult dragon popping its head over and seeing what's going on here and definitely sets the tone of the zine, which is classical fantasy D&D tropes with a bit of humour thrown in. The vast majority of the content in this scene is the tavern and inn generator with 29 tables for generating different parts of the inn from where it's located, the type, the format of its name, the different parts of its name, all the kind of different things that you'd find there. So details of the innkeeper, what food and drink it has, different things that are going on in the area, what postings you'd find on the notice board, and then a series of tables for rolling up the different patrons that you might find there. This takes about the first 30 pages of the zine and it's really in depth and in detail. It says here that there's a tavern character sheet at the end of the issue that isn't actually there. I've looked on the PDF version, which I've got as well. There isn't a tavern character sheet there either. So I've just written this information up in a Word document, which wasn't too difficult. Although I think having something a bit easier to reference and look at would definitely have been appreciated. The tables are generally very readable. As you can see, very clear printing here. They do seem to stretch on in weird ways, sometimes going over two, three pages. You can see here they're just really dense with information. All of these tables could be adjusted to suit your needs if you didn't like a result in there you could change it or if you wanted to change some of the numbers on them to get different result bandings that would, you could do that as well. So just here on the innkeeper's race table you get 25% of the time the innkeeper is a male human, 25% of the time the innkeeper is a female human and then all the other combinations here are within the final 50%. So you could easily change the numbers here to get different spreads of people that are the innkeeper. Maybe even introduce more results to get a wider variety of different races depending on what, what's present in the game you're playing. I particularly like the name generator um, here at the beginning, which has a table here for generating the format of the inn name. So even if you are rolling on the same three tables, you're combining the words in different ways. I also like the innkeeper's personality table here where on an odd result you pick the first word and on an even result you pick the second. So you've got these paired traits here, energetic, lazy, organized, distracted, truthful, deceitful, and then depending on what you roll, each banding has multiple results in it, you will end up with one or the other of those. The common fair table here, you don't roll on it directly, but each time that somebody asks for something off the list, you could roll up the price for it, then make the note it down as that inn's price for that food. And then any bartering that would go on around that, you then have a set price for that in for that item. Similar to this is the services table here, which tells you the percentage chance that a service is available and then you roll to see what the cost is. So not all of these are going to be available at every inn, although I'd expect that the inns you roll up that have stables, stabling will be available at them. So I've actually already rolled up an inn. I'm just going to read it out now. I've written it up in a prose style as if it was a GM introducing the inn to a player, so it does assume that the player takes some actions and moves on through the scene. So I'll just read that now. If you want to skip the inn description, please skip forwards to approximately 9 minutes through the video. Walking through the city streets, you adjust your loot strap on your shoulder to make it more comfortable. Tonight you'll be providing entertainment at the Bloody Griffin, a good sized inn that is locally famous for its live frog pie. It's only a short distance away, and you can just about hear one of the other regular entertainers, Jemima the Moo Talker and her mystical cow Puddles, closing up their act. As you round the corner, you see the inn's carved wooden sign illuminated by the second floor dormitory's windows, a stylized rampant griffin with a lance through its neck, leaking blood onto its pale body. Approaching from down the street, you shout a greeting to the ostler, who is just about to finish stabling a horse, and he gives you a grave look and beckons you over. Under his breath, he tells you to be on the lookout tonight, as rumour has it that the counsellor who died the other night was last seen having a drink in this establishment. At this, he looks you in the eye and gets back to work, as it is well known that the specialty drink on offer at the Bloody Griffin is called the Touch of the Asp, a drink made with a drop of asp venom watered down by wine. Usually it gives the wine a slight kick and the drinker a monster hangover, but it might not be enough to stop the bailiffs from assuming foul play. 
You thank the ostler for the heads up and head inside the inn. Opening the main door, you are met by a blast of warm, smoky air and the sound of laughing from the patrons inside. Looking around, you can see that most of the tables are full, but spot a smaller one at the back of the common room that is free and sit down under the framed autograph of Thurl, the saviour of Nettledon, vanquisher of the Northern Manticore. Depositing your loot in an empty chair, you ring the bell attached to the centre of the table for service and wait patiently, looking around at the patrons. Your eyes are immediately drawn to the two men sitting a couple of tables over, talking excitedly to one another. One wears the distinctive robe of an apothecary and is gesturing wildly as he talks, causing the small dribble of snot that runs from his nose to catch the light. The other man wears the expensive clothes of a noble, but even from here you can see the ink stains on his fingers, meaning that he must be some sort of merchant. He seems to be listening to what the apothecary has to say, but you can see that he can't take his eyes off the glistening patch on the other man's upper lip, and is subconsciously wiping his own perfectly dry nose with his handkerchief. Suddenly the merchant stands up from his chair with a loud thunk, revealing that his right leg below the knee is wooden and is elaborately carved with floral patterns. Slapping the framed autograph above the table he has sat at, he loudly exclaims, And the dratted hero of Isling, whose table we now sit at, was nowhere to be found when the ankeg bit my leg off, despite what the peasants believe. The tables full of patrons around them are suddenly much quieter. As you wait to see what happens next, you are brought back to your senses by a tap on your table, as is one of the servers carrying a massive, faintly croaking pie. He reminds you that you should probably head up to the bar to order your food, as the innkeeper is deaf enough that she won't have heard the bell over the raucous noise of the inn. This puzzles you, as the lady who owns the inn can't be much past middle age, but you realise you don't actually know how long half-elves live, or how quickly they age, and that she could be old enough to be your grandmother, and you might not even know it. Thanking him, you stand up and look back over to the table with the merchant and the apothecary, but they are back in quiet conversation, and the tables around them have resumed loudly talking and laughing. Wading through the thick smoke of the common room, you make your way to the bar, positioning yourself so you can see your loot from across the room, and flag down the innkeeper. Recognising you, she flashes you a smile, and as she walks over, she immediately starts talking to you about her day, the troublesome patrons she's had, and everything else that comes to her. Eventually, you manage to order a flagon of ale and a slice of meat pie, and it's really not a long wait before a bowl and a cup are set in front of you. Doing a double take, you see that what's been placed in front of you is in fact a bowl of porridge and a cup of strong mead. The innkeeper gives you a wink and says that she just knows you'll enjoy it better than what you've ordered and is swiftly called to the other end of the bar to serve another patron. You know better than to try and argue with her, as last time she did she patiently waited for you to make your point before telling you to try the food and drink she put in front of you. It turned out that she was right and it exactly hit the spot. You don't know if it was a fluke and that she was just covering for her poor hearing or if she does in fact know what people want to eat more than they do themselves. Turning with your cup and bowl, you head back to your table making a small detour to pass by the table with a merchant and apothecary. Passing by, you can hear the apothecary talking quietly to the merchant, and that would just be the start. With your funds, we could even form cells in other cities and take back what the taxman has... He cuts off mid-sentence, noticing you listen in as you pass. Once back at your table, you see the two men and get up and make to leave, although not pausing before a large poster that you hadn't noticed before. The annual Sturge Count begins this weekend. Groups of Sturgers will be provided with several leaves of parchment, a quill and ink. A potion of healing for each participant will also be made available for those who want one. Accuracy is important. Please know your breeds of Sturge and be able to identify males from females. We will gather in the field where last year's Ankeg attack took place. You can just about make out the merchant's face pull into a snarl of anger when he reads that last line. And even after he has left, you can hear his wooden legs stomping away down the street. Settling back into your seat, you begin to eat the porridge in front of you. It is, in fact, exactly what you wanted. Once you've finished your food, you pick up your loot and cup of meat and make your way over towards a small area clear of tables and chairs, but for a lone stool in the centre. When you're halfway there, the inn's front door slams open and a stranger walks inside. And at that point, one of the other player characters could walk in, or you could start the adventure in some other way. So overall, I think it's a really detailed generator. It's got lots of unique lines in the different tables. Uh, each time you roll on them, they give you something different and flavourful. I do think it's a bit crunched up in its layout and having the tavern character sheet would have been really useful. So I think they've definitely missed something out there. But I can definitely see myself using this to roll up in throughout many different campaigns and games. Although maybe I wouldn't use it in the session, you'd have to know beforehand because there's just a lot of different things that you can roll up. Following on from the taverns is a section on the NPC magic user, the Dwarven Rune Mage. So the Dwarven Rune Mage is a Dwarven Mage that uses their magic to help Dwarven society. So they're not seen as artisans, even if they are highly trained and specialized, but they use their magic to help with general Dwarven life, such as helping in the mines, fixing broken tools, ensuring that everything is structurally sound. And it even states that if something does require 
expert uh, construction that the room agent will be there to help with the basic work but, it, but artisans will come in to finish it off. So it gives the law and the backstory of what the class is and what you should expect from it there. It then gives the rules for how to generate one such as uh, the size of its hit dice and that it uses the same experience points and spell slot progressions as illusionists and then some extra details here such as they have an improved uh, notice stonework features role here and then how their spells work using stone tablets rather than a spell book. Following that there's then the descriptions of different spells available to them and then how they would use those spells in their work as a rune mage such as arrays when tunnels have been adequately mapped arrays is used to remove any arcane marks used in their construction, levitate Dwarves are perfectionists, and this includes making certain that the layout of their massive chambers is symmetrical. Levitate allows a dwarf to get a literal bird's eye view of their creation. Any flaws in the room's geography will become immediately apparent. That continues all the way up to the sixth level spells here. It does say here that they are an NPC magic user. I don't know why specifically, as you'd expect a NPC style stat block for something like that whereas it gives you more information here of how to create one like you would a regular character. So I don't see why you couldn't allow a player to use one of these as their character, as it gives the fully fleshed out rules for it here. But it is laid out differently too, as we'll see later, the actual player character class that this zine includes, which is, seems to me a bit of an unusual choice. What comes next is a review of four miniatures, the Necromancer from Ralph Partha, the Cleric, from Grenadier Models, the female monk in robes from Otherworld Miniatures, and the monk from TSR Hobbies. It's quite interesting to see the author's opinion on the miniatures here, although because of the limited space on them, you can't go into too much detail. But as they are older models, they're definitely going to be rarer and probably quite expensive these days. And finally here, we have the Marksman class, which is a subclass of fighter specializing on, in all forms of archery as well as thrown weapons. They can fire ranged weapons further than the average fighter and can fire them faster as well. Also, if they are ready to act and but they are surprised, they get to fire their arrow rather than lose their action. And they get some special rules for being able to attempt particularly hard trick shots. So as I said before, this is how the player character class is laid out. It's definitely much more readable if you are trying to play it as a player character class than the Dwarven Rune Mage. It's pretty straightforward and I don't have any problems with this at all. I just think it's a bit of a shame that the Dwarven Rune Mage wasn't laid out appropriately, although there was a lot more backstory and lore to the Dwarven Rune Mage than the idea of a Marksman as a character class. So the extra space spent on the Dwarven Rune Mage laying out that backstory is probably a bit more appropriate. And then this is the first zine that I've covered actually that has adverts in it, but lots of zines do have them and they're not, they're not uncommon at all. So there's these couple of pages of adverts at the back here for RPG related products. So that's Black Dragon, volume one, number one. It's quite a straightforward zine. Uh, everything that it contains is listed here on the front, the, with the tavern and inns taking up the majority of the space. I don't think this is a problem at all as the depth of the tavern and inn generator is second to none and it really is the standout part of this scene. I also like the rune mage NPC and the new class the marksman, both really good. I'd be happy to have players run either of those in my campaign. The miniature review feels a little out of place but as far as articles and zines go it's pretty unassuming. There's just a little addition in between the two classes so no problems with it really. Other than that I don't really have much else to say about it so thank you for watching.